Hello, I'm Tim Harris. This is Julie Harris, and this is Real Estate Coaching Radio. That's right. So make sure that you hit the subscribe button so you won't miss any future episodes. Thanks again for popping by. Hit that like button, and don't forget to leave your comments and questions so we can get right back with you. We will. Thank you for continuing to make our podcast, Real Estate Coaching Radio, the number one listened to podcast for real estate professionals in at least the United States. And let us know what you think about this video. Leave your comments below. Thank you. Welcome back. We have a really fun show for all of you today. Now, before we get to the topic, there is some breaking news. Should we have some breaking news sound effect? (laughs) All right. So here's some breaking news. I have, Julie and I have, been battling against these um, clickbait Mickey Mouse articles that are floating around online that's saying, and this is always how it, and I've seen this on YouTube videos. I've seen people, frankly, that should know better are saying Um, this misinformation. And here's what it is. Ready? NAR said the total number of agents is going to drop by 30% in 2023. I bet you guys have read that too. So when you read headlines like that, that sounds pretty bad, right? I mean, that sounds like why the heck would you want to be in the real estate business? Everybody's getting out. Right. So someone started, uh, basically, Julie and I researched the genealogy of this, you know, Mickey Mouse. And we found out that it was said by somebody who was ill-informed, making up something about, you know, basically clickbait. And by the way, Inman did an article similar uh, with a similar title, which was also obviously clickbait. NARS membership is now shrinking for the first time in years, doom and gloom. So we're going to give you guys some facts and then we're going to get to today's show. And so why are we telling you this? Because we want you to understand that it is easy to manipulate people using fear and for whatever reason, there's a lot of people out there that are trying to freak you out about being in the you know being a, a real estate agent right now. Whereas Julie and I are, have taken and are taking the exact opposite stance. This is the best time to be in real estate in at least the last 15 years because the greatest fortunes of men and women have always been made during the greatest times of change. And uh, guys, right now, if you have a skills-based and frankly, people helping uh, based approach to your real estate business, you will make a fortune. How do I know? Because we have thousands of coaching clients that are doing just that. So here are some facts. And forgive me for those of you who want to believe the sky is falling. It is not falling. NAR did not say that there was going to be a 30% drop in agents in 2023. And here's the actual fact. This is from today. NAR monthly membership report said 1.5 million, there's 1.5 million members of the National Association of Realtors, up from 1.53 million members last month. But year over year, uh uh-oh, there was a decrease of less than 1%, of 0.66% decrease in members. So indeed, the sky is not falling. At the end of 2022, the total number of NARA members was 1.58 million members. Okay, I want you to remember this because, again, that is certainly not a 30% decrease. And uh, by the way, that's less than a 3% decrease. Julie figured it out as a 2.8% decrease, not 30%. And at the peak, just for those of you guys who are wonkish about this stuff, like Julie and I, at the peak at the end, uh, you know, as in terms of the peak number of agents, rather the peak number of members of the National Association of Realtors, because not every real estate agent is a member of NAR, at the peak of 2022 was 1.58 million members. The point is massive opportunity is happening right now for those of you who do not believe the sky is falling. So make sure you purge from your mind that you're not in the right place at the right time because you absolutely are. And I guess from an opportunity opportunistic perspective, if your competitors are believing that tomorrow is not going to be better for uh, uh, versus today, they are certainly not going to learn the skills necessary to compete and uh, frankly thrive in this market. And indeed, they will make their tomorrow worse than today. So keep all these things in mind and be your own best guru and start putting some very big moats, deep, deep, deep moats with lots of nasty alligators, alligators yeah. and you know all kinds of things to protect your frankly, your mindset, but also your approach to life and to real estate. Everybody seems to love a clickbaity doom and gloom headline. Don't be one of those people because then what will happen is it adversely affects the actions you take today, which will lock in your tomorrow not being as good as what it otherwise could have uh, could have been. And that is an absolute shame. And those, you know, that way of thinking can last decades. We've seen it. So please don't let it happen to you. And if you are Uh, caught in the mire of the Mickey Mouse. This is your opportunity. This is your wake up call. Change your direction urgently. All right. So off to the topic today, Julie, which is? Yes, we're talking about 12 easy ways to sell your listings fast. Now, why are we talking about that? Well, here's a fact for you. 
Not all listings are selling immediately with multiple offers, not anymore. If you're sitting on any listing that isn't getting consistent showings, isn't getting offers, and seems way too quiet, you may need to implement these strategies to get them sold before they expire on you. Yes, even in a mostly hot seller's market, some listings will sit on the market longer than you or your seller want. You told me about a uh, coaching call you had last week where someone was um, sort of emotionally unhinged because something was taking like a week to sell oh. versus what, what, tell, tell them the story. I say this with love, Patrick Murphy in Columbus, Ohio, <laughs> uh, who, who put a beautiful new listing, as it turns out, uh, because he sent me the MLS of it in Plain City for about 550 gorgeous new construction. And his comment was, well, I put it on last night. Where are my offers? Why, why aren't there offers? What's going on? And I said, well, tomorrow's Sunday, do an open house, sell it yourself. So, you know, that's showing you the expectation that we all have come to know that you put it on, on Thursday, it's going to be sold with multiple offers by Sunday. And if you're not in contract by Monday, something must be terribly wrong. But, but what is happening is sometimes listings are still selling with multiple offers and sometimes they are not. And Patrick Murphy, when Julie and I sold real estate in guess where? Your market. <laughs> uh, there, the average days in the market was 141 days. Yeah. And most listings, it was like 60% of all listings would sell on the second or third listing agent. In other words, they expired. Yep. Julie and I could roll into listing appointments and be and essentially be proud that our average days in the market was only 61 days. Yeah. <laughs> I told him that, but you know what was interesting is we talked about what was different there, aside from longer days in the market, et cetera, and that being normal. The difference is the expectation in the market. Because when things were longer for us, it had been like that for a while, and sellers were not, I mean, they would still start to freak out around about day 45 to 60, but it wasn't like on hour four, right? Well, so why is Julie saying that? Think about what she's saying. You have to take a, an approach when dealing with sellers or buyers for that matter that is congruent with this market. And if you're not setting the expectation that it might be a bit of a relationship prior to them actually having the closing, then they will be disappointed. Your job is to head off their objections. It's kind of like using our pre-listing pack. Head off their objections before the actual, for the house actually has uh, been listed. You've got to let them know what to expect. And by the way, as part of our coaching program, obviously we teach all of you guys how to do that. All right, Julie, let's roll into this. Yes. Okay. So the question to write down in your notes, I know a lot of our listeners take notes. Uh, do you actually know all the unexpected ways to sell your listings quickly? Your mission is to make your listing stand out amongst the competition, even if there's only two or three competing with you. Why would a buyer choose your listing versus the one that's for sale down the street? Why would a buyer's agent choose yours to show today when there are five other choices, especially if there's new construction to show? Why buy your listing when there's, well, I just said that, new construction with builder incentives? All right, so we're going to go through these. These are 12 ways. We're going to go through them relatively quickly, and we'll hover on the ones that might be more complicated. You really, really meant that point about builder incentives. I really, really meant that. Super duper. <laughs> well, I mean, it does smell nicer and it's staged, so you got to consider that. Okay, instead of or in addition to a price adjustment, depending on how long it's been around, right? Do any or all of the following. Number one. Seller to contribute 10000 or if it's less expensive, 5000 towards the buyer's closing costs. Now, why do you do this? This can help a buyer buy down the interest rate and lock it in at a potentially far lower uh, rate than the going mortgage rate. This is paid at settlement and flows through the title agent or attorney closing the transaction. This can actually impact the buyer's payment more than the price. Okay, so how would you go about offering these incentives? You put them in the MLS. In some cases, you actually put it in the home brochure that when the co-ops are showing it or you're showing it to your own buyer, they can also then see you know, the fact that buying this house is going to actually save the buyer whatever the amount of money is that the seller has pre-agreed to uh, contribute towards the buyer's closing costs. Right. And they, they can, we're calling it closing costs. They can buy down the rate or not. At, the bottom line is it's less money out of the buyer's pocket. If they want to use it to buy down the rate, that's less payment out of their pocket. So you're giving them options. That's better than somebody else's listing. And remember, what we're doing here is we're showing you guys how you, A, can be more competitive with new construction, but really be more competitive with any of the other properties right. that are for sale. You are, most of you, except our friends in California and other markets in San Francisco and such, you guys are in really crazy hot sellers markets still. That, for the most part, is going to continue, but there will be pockets and you will take listings, especially if you're following our listing process, where you might take something that actually doesn't sell itself in 22 seconds. In those cases, this 
is going to be your plan of action in addition to what we offer in the coaching program. When you walk into, here's how maybe a way you should use this. When you're walking into a listing appointment and it's an expired or maybe it's a house that's a little harder to sell, you know, from having done your CMA, maybe have these 12 points that you can present to the seller and let them know that this is our additional plan of action because of the nature of that individual home's market. There you go. Point number two, you could have your seller pay for one year or even two years of a buyer's homeowners association dues. Again, paid from the seller's proceeds at closing. If the monthly HOA is $300, then maybe a $3,600 HOA credit from the seller would be better than a $5,000 price reduction. Again, you're going to put this in your MLS description in your agent comments. It would at least make your listing stand out in the MLS. Perhaps you end up doing both instead of a $10,000 reduction. See, we're being creative. Okay, point number three, your seller might pay one year of property taxes for the buyer. You just said something really good, Julie. You just blazed okay, over sorry. it. So Julie said, and I want you to think about this. Let's say the house is $10,000 overpriced, but you can offer the buyer to pay the buyer's closing cost or uh, you know, uh, contribute money towards buying their interest rate down on their mortgage. And you can agree to pay their HOA and not reduce the price. Yes, I know it's you know still contributing money to the buyer, but it'll make the house more marketable because the buyer and the buyer's agent's going to see there's more incentives to sell that particular listing, maybe even more so than reducing the price by $10,000. Because reducing the price by $10,000 does not have nearly as much impact as, say, for example, doing Julie's first idea, which is buying down the interest rates, so you, or maybe even you know having the buyer, the, the seller pay the homeowner's fees for the next year, year or two then like a $10,000 reduction is barely noticeable in a monthly payment, assuming they're taking a loan. Those other two things, that's actual cash flow. You guys get it? Be creative. Point it's, number three. It's tangible, right? Okay, so point number three, seller could pay a year of property taxes for the buyer. Paid at closing by the seller. Similar concept to our previous points, but depends on how much we're talking about. If it's too much, you could do a six-month tax credit. That could work as well. And of course, all this is disclosed. There's no monkey business that we're suggesting here. Point number four, Julie. If the house has condition issues, consider a decorating allowance to be escrowed at closing by the seller for the buyer. Always get feedback so you know if decorating is actually the issue. If a buyer loves the house but just can't live with that carpet, the seller can give a carpet allotment, for example, and get that buyer to buy. That said, it's always a good idea to have the house completely conditioned, especially if it's a tougher market, yep. prior to putting the house for sale. Uh, because frankly, a lot of people, if they don't like the condition of something, won't even stick around to read the That's fact right. that there's a decorating allowance. Yes. Now this, this particular thing where you give the allotment that helps sellers that don't have the cash to do those repairs or don't want to spend the cash to do those repairs, but you continually get that same objection. You can do an allotment. Okay, and again, this is an addition to or instead of price reductions. Point number five, pay for two years of a home warranty for the buyer. Make sure this is included in the comments. This is a pretty inexpensive perk, costing about 450 bucks for a year of coverage. In many markets, it's not offered by the seller, and for years it wasn't even asked for by the buyer or buyer's agents, lest they lose the bidding war. So make sure you put in the MLS comments if you would offer this incentive. Advanced lesson here, those of you who have rental properties, keep a home warranty. We use yes. AHS, don't we? Yep. Keep an AHS warranty in all your rental properties because it'll save you a ton of money when it comes to major appliance repairs like furnaces and whatnot. Julie uses uh, HOA on our, I'm sorry, AHS. Um, AHS on our rentals on an ongoing basis. Always, all the time. Okay. Yes. Uh, all right. Number six, add a thousand dollar commission bonus to a buyer's agent if it's pending by a certain date. Again, be sure to list this in the MLS comments and perhaps on your home brochure as well. Now, I have a little uh, asterisk here. Always do a new seller's net sheet when you're adding any of these seller's concessions to the transaction. Make sure the seller knows how their bottom line will be impacted. Many of these concessions will actually cost less than a price reduction or make the price reduction a smaller one when combined with this concession. Again, the point is to make your listing stand out. If I'm on, I'm a, a buyer, I'm looking on realtor.com or whatever, and I see three listings that meet my criteria, but this one pays for my HOA dues. That's going to reduce my payment by 300 bucks for a year. Maybe I want to see that first, right? So for example. Some of you guys get your, you know, get a little worked up when there's an idea of a buyer's agent's uh, commission and I, or a buyer's agent's incentive. And I'll just summarize by, you know, quoting Charlie Munger, of course, yep. you know, show me the incentive and I'll show you the result. So I'm not, and Julie and I aren't suggesting that you're going to, um, like you as a buyer's agent, aren't going to sell one home over another no. because there's an incentive. 
um, and you're going to get paid more personally. Of course, you're not going to do that. But there is going to be a little bit, let's just say, an incentive for you for that buyer to buy that particular house. Or frankly, maybe you could even use that um, added bonus that the seller is going to pay you for selling their property for something for that particular buyer. Closing I mean, gift. Or maybe the, you know, you're buying that buyer lead. There's a good way to pay yeah. that referral fee. Yeah. And by the way, builders do that kind of thing all the time. Of they course. send out right now, that's pretty hot to send out their inventory homes with a sliding scale of what they want to move first as it, a higher commission. To that point, Julie, because I just scanned your points, it's not there. You, and again, this is all about how to base, you know, motivate buyers to buy your house or buyer's agents to show your property. If you are, this is kind of an aside, if you're in a market where there's new construction, we talk about this constantly. Julie, you told me something this morning on our walk, the 30% of all available property, or is it sales, in the United States was new homes? 33%. Where, where new, was it sales? Uh, or of available homes either on the market already or being built are 33% of what's, yeah, what's for sale. Okay, so if it's you're not, you have to, absolutely positive, and we've done tons of past podcasts on this topic. We drill down this endlessly in Premier Coaching. You 100% must have new construction on your radar. Many of you are blessed with an enormous amount of new homes for sale that aren't in the MLS, that you're not even really fully aware of, that your buyers are probably going to stumble across and might go into contract with that you then might not get the commission on because you did not introduce them to the house that's, you know, obviously the new construction. Keep these things in mind. You have to be, this guys, this is the reason a market like this creates more opportunity because you're smart enough to listen to this podcast. You're now going to take action on the thing I just said. You're now going to stumble across, as we've coached you to do on previous shows in the coaching program, these new home build reps. They're going to tell you their available inventory of homes that, by the way, are not in the MLS. You're now going to have essentially legal off-market listings that you can sell to your buyers oh and guess what the new build rep really liked you and now she or he is going to refer those buyers that also have properties to sell now you have listing leads that don't are not you know associated with the referral fee you guys get it yes. that's the reason there's more opportunity now for those of you who are willing to actually take very much proactive action point number seven the seller here's a radical idea this is in your comments seller does not require inspections waived Again, a new concept that replaces the old markets as is requirements. How many of the buyers out there are so sick of being pushed around and you've got to buy it as is or you're not competitive? You mean buyers? Yes, buyers I have to, sorry, buyers yeah. have to say, yes, I'll buy it as is. I'll deal with the inspection consequences. Well, what if your listing stands out that they don't have to put up with that because your seller's confident, you know, whatever comes up, I'll fix it or there's not much wrong in the first place. Okay, so advanced coaching on this, get the house pre-inspected. Smart. By having the house pre-inspected, have a good home inspector, go out there, do an inspection. It's going to cost three to 500 bucks. If the you know seller is you know jittery about spending three to five hundred bucks, tell them you'll reimburse them at closing. They pay for the inspection. You reimburse them at closing, or ideally you don't reimburse them at all. They just pay for it themselves. Then a, right next, and you leave this in the kitchen counter or wherever. Then right next to the home, uh, the home ins uh, property inspection, you then have the receipts from the work having been fixed. Do you think when a buyer is walking in and they see the inspection is there and they see the work has been done? Yeah, sure. Some of them are going to be skeptical and still want to get the you know house reinspected. That's fine. But they're going to see all the work was done. Oh, and by the way, there's also a two years of home warranty that the sellers already agreed to pay for. Do you guys see how these added incentives? Make it so not only are you going to be far more competitive with resale, but now you're actually going to compete with new construction too. Yes. Okay. Point number eight. Now stay with me on this because this is better in the lower price ranges overall. You can advertise payments instead of price. Now, it's true that rates have gone up, but they are still historically low and combined with the fact that rents are historically high. Historically low being, you know, more than just the last 15 years. So when Julie says Correct. historically low, she's not just talking about since like, you know, five years ago. She's talking about 30 years, 50 years, right? All these, you know, the interest rate on mortgages is historically low. And frankly, rents are historically high as a percent of people's monthly income. That's right. And so in those price ranges, this makes a lot of sense. You advertise the payment instead of the price. This does two things. It shows especially houses, you know, this is like 350 to 550 for most uh, areas where somebody's paying decent rent, right? They're not just like bottom of the bucket rent. So they can compare and they can say, well, I can't believe I could buy a house for 450 for what I'm already paying in rent. That does one thing, but it's also good for the agent because when you advertise the price, they're going to call you to find out the actual price. We're only going through point 10, That's just so fine. you know. Okay. So next we have point number nine. Have your favorite lender create a rate sheet to give away at showings, open houses, and on your home brochures. The rate sheet should show 
three different ways of purchasing the home, 30-year fixed, which everybody expects, an adjustable, and something else with the lowest payment. You're showing creativity there. For 15 years, we have lived with the expectation it's just a 30-year fixed with 20% down. Let's drill down on that. So the lender's going to do the work. That way, the lender is then responsible for the outcome of whether the numbers are factual or not. Their problem. Yes. Their errors and omissions. Okay, but you're also then, remember Julie's first point, you're going to have the buyer, I'm sorry, the seller buy down the interest rate. So you're going to be able to have the lender do, maybe this is a, just being creative, but it's an idea, have a payment of a you know, $500,000 house, let's assume that's the list price, with no buy down. Then buy this house and this is your payment because the seller has already agreed to buy the rate down and this is what your rate would be, this is what your payment would be. You guys get it? Oh, and by the way, this seller is also paying your property taxes for the next however long and they're paying the HOA for however long. Some of you guys have markets where there's two HOAs like where we live. So yeah. you're going to have things like that. And if the seller is paying those things, it makes it so when that buyer walks in and they see what that payment is, uh, and they're going to then see, well, I guess I buy this one and I like this house enough and maybe it needs carpet. I'm still going to buy it because look at the fact that it's already, by the way, pre-inspected. The repairs have been done. You guys getting this? Do you see how all this works up to the point where you're going to make it so that your houses are more marketable, more sellable? But here's the big picture way of thinking about all of this. You're explaining all this to a seller. Maybe it's an expired seller. Maybe the seller is a little bit skeptical of agents. Maybe they feel like they've been burned and they don't want to be burned twice. You're walking through all these scenarios and all these things you're going to do for them. And just imagine all the other agents that you're competing against, they're not going to be able to hold a candle to your creativity. This seller is going to think that you're operating at a completely different level uh, because you are. In our opinion, the single greatest opportunity right now in real estate to become a listing agent is absolutely expired listings. Yeah. Expired listings, older expireds, if you're in a market where there's not a lot of freshies, Julie and I are suggesting you go back two years. But specifically during the pandemic, uh, pandemic that was a great time for, you know, a lot of those didn't get relisted for all kinds of reasons. And our number one suggested source for going after expires listings is Red X. And Red X is a system that will go and actually research all of the uh, listings that have expired. And you can have them go back in time, like I said, and then tell you that get you usually five or six phone numbers and all the information, making sure it's not relisted and the seller's you know names. And all they the do this every day. Yeah. So you wake up in the morning, you turn on your computer and there are all the newest expireds. And then you can also work the older expired list. Again, that's frankly where I would start. So you all should be subscribing to Red X and we've arranged for you to get a $150 discount. And all you got to do is just text the word RED, R-E-D, text the word RED to 47372, text the word RED to 47372. And when you do, we'll text you back a link. And that is our, um, frankly, it's a microsite that when you subscribe there, you'll get the $150 discount. Text the word RED to 47372. Julie and I occasionally get asked, if you guys were to get back into real estate, what would mm -hmm. you do? Well, pretty much everything we say on the podcast but the number one source of listing leads we would definitely be going after, because frankly, it's the greatest source of listing leads, is expired listings and then centers of influence and past clients and all the other things we teach you in Premier Coaching. But absolutely expired listings right now. So text the word RED, R-E-D, to 47372. Remember when texting, message and data rates may apply. Okay, point number 10 is number 10 for a reason, because this is a little bit advanced, but it's a great tool. Find out if your seller, assuming they have a mortgage, has an assumable mortgage or not. If they do, what's the rate and what are the requirements? It's, I think, section four of all mortgage documents. So they should have a copy of that. If they don't, they can get it from their lender. I can't believe you know that. Anyway. It's because it's come up on coaching calls. Okay. So what is the rate? <laughs> if the rate is worse, it probably is not, but check what the rate is and what are the requirements? So it, uh, advertise in your MLS description as well as your home brochures. Now, note to self. They don't know what that means. I'm going to go back to that. Give me a second. Okay. All FHA, VA, and USDA mortgages, all of them are assumable, and some other types of loans as well. An assumable means you're a homeowner, okay? You've got your house for sale. It's not paid off. You've got a mortgage on it, okay? You did, let's say, a, an FHA loan five years ago when rates were still really low. And your FHA rate was 3.75. Fixed at 3.75 for 30 years. Yes. Okay. So did you know that I, as the buyer, could assume your loan, assuming that I qualify? So you can call the lender, find out what the qualifications are, and I can literally assume that rate. It's called assumable with release. By the way, back in the uh, way before Julie and I were in real estate, 
but there was called something called assumable without release, which means basically if someone showed up and wanted to buy your house, they came up with whatever equity you had and they could just assume your loan and the, uh, you know, the FHA, VA, USDA and whatnot didn't even have to approve it. You would just be the new owner. How Done crazy deal. is that? So now it's assumable with release. So they'll still have to qualify. But as you guys know, a lot of these government backed loan products, they have lower standards in this particular case. Now I'm going to carry this idea forward because sure. it is a great idea. Again, this is something that when you're talking to a prospective seller, you talk about, you know, section four of the mortgage <laughs> and it's, you, know, right. you guys get it. That's right. going to be something that's going to give you guys a lot of confidence. Now let's say as will be the case that someone, I'll just make up real numbers here, $500,000 house. There's a hundred thousand dollar mortgage. There's a four hundred. I'm sorry, hundred thousand dollars in equity. Four hundred thousand dollar mortgage. Killer interest rate. Killer terms. Way better than you can get now. Your buyer wants to assume that mortgage. Well, of course they do. But there's a hundred thousand dollars that the seller obviously makes. Here's the idea. Let's assuming if your buyer doesn't have that hundred thousand dollars, they might not. Um, a lot of them won't. But they do have, say, $20,000. You'll get them to pay, uh, you know, put $20,000 down, which goes to the seller. And then that $80,000 that the seller would have um, obviously made had they just sold it conventionally without having an assumable, that then is in the form of a second mortgage. I know I'm getting into the weeds here, but this is how it would work. The buyer would assume the mortgage at this really great interest rate. The uh, Then they would also have a second mortgage for that $80,000. And you can amortize that over 30 years. You can put a seven-year balloon on that, whatever. And what will generally happen is this, the house will inflate or appreciate to the point where then the buyer might, you know, frankly, um, refinance it, though I doubt if rates are going to be lower in the future. Or the, uh, the actual uh, mortgagee, the owner who now has that $80,000 loan, might because they like the interest rate. You're going to have to pay the interest rate on that second. It's going to have to be better than whatever they can get in T-bills. So it's going to have to probably be, you know, six or seven percent. But you know, it's still only on, in this case, 80 grand. Only on their It's equity. not on the whole 500,000. Exactly. So that's going to give your buyer an opportunity. Now, why would a buyer want to do that? What's their cash flow like? If their option is to get a, a mortgage at six and a half percent over 30 years, if they took a new loan out, or a existing loan at three and a half percent, or in some cases less than three percent, their actual their actual payment, even with the seller second, is going to be less than if it had been over thirty years at uh, six and a half percent. You guys following me on all this? I know this is a little advanced. That's why it's number ten. That's the reason it's number okay. ten. But don't you think your listing would be more attractive, even if they don't actually follow through with the whole assumable? You're going to be the first one to get shown versus five other houses that don't have that option. The buyer's going to at least consider it, right? They're going to at least compare their options of their payments. Well, you know, I love being a listing agent, right? That was my only thing I really liked about real estate. And as I'm as you're going through your points that you wrote. I was imagining I couldn't help myself mm -hmm. being in front of an yeah. expired seller and giving them the list of things that you, you know, your 10 points that we're going to do uh, with their permission, obviously, to incentive, incentive, I always screw that Incentivize. word Incentivize. Thank you. The buyers and the buyer's agents to want to purchase their property. No, you'd have mm -hmm. to ask their permission if sure. they wanted to do the loan. And I'll tell you what most sellers will say. They'll say it depends on the buyer. And that's a good answer. Yeah. And a lot of times you'd be surprised. A lot of sellers especially older people, frankly, would be more than happy to do a second for the sell for the buyer because the interest rate on that loan is going to be greater than what they're going to get in CDs or treasury bills or bonds or whatever. And it is a, record it is a recorded lien on the yeah. property, so we're not doing any monkey business here. It's just that the homeowner, you know, the seller is a private mortgage holder, and that all happens at title. Yep. So an experienced title company will know exactly how to file all that. Right. This is the way that you set yourself apart in this marketplace. Just having these points should give you confidence. It, then from that confidence, because you have the knowledge, I bet you're feeling motivated. That's how true motivation happens, guys. You don't work on your mindset. I talked about this the other day. Some of you commented that you appreciated that because you've been working on your mindset and reading every self-help book mm -hmm. known to man. Look, those books are all, they all have a place. I'm not really sure where that place is, but someplace. Back in the bookshelf at Barnes & Noble. The way you get everlasting uh, you know, motivation is from actually taking the action and then your mental, emotional state will follow the action. That's the way life really works. There's very, very, very few things that come from overthinking. You don't overthink and then get into action. You get into action, especially in a relatively simple business like selling real estate. And then as you see yourself doing what you didn't want to do when you didn't want to do it at the highest level, 
you see yourself helping people and frankly making money, that all of a sudden you are not having a motivational issue. So please keep these things in mind and please do remember, stop listening to the garbage that's out there that any, how do you know if it's garbage? After you read it, after you consume it, how do you feel? If you feel depressed, if you feel pessimistic, any way other, anything other than, you know, you're going to take on the world, that was garbage that you shouldn't have consumed in the first place. Who cares what the motivation of the point of, of the person producing the content was? It doesn't matter. Don't worry about it. But I have yet to come across a, a headline anywhere on the internet, anywhere on YouTube about real estate that is not doom and gloom. And it's all um, essentially founded in conjecture. None of it's uh, founded in facts. And there is only a few of us in the industry right now, Julie and I, Logan. Motoshami, I, I was going to say Housing Wire stays a off of the salacious headlines and is very fact oriented. Yes. And, and frankly, Nar. Yes. You know, there's only a few of us that are basing what we're saying on facts, not basing what we're saying on what we want the future to be. And what a lot of these folks are doing is they're trying to get you to the do click the doom and gloom stuff because they're trying to sell you something. Right. Because people. So you got to ask yourself, why is it that you're attracted to the doom and gloom? Now, let's move past the why, because you're never going to figure that one out. And let's move to the what is the cost of you being attracted to the doom and gloom? We just gave you 10 points that should motivate the heck out of you guys. It should make you more optimistic because you are now empowered with information that other people don't have. No, I'll put it to work. Go out there and help people make money, guys. That's what this market is all about. Thank you for keeping this number one listen to daily podcast for real estate professionals in at least the United States. Have a fantastic day. We'll talk with you on the show tomorrow. Hello. Thank you for having watched this video. Please remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's right. And don't forget to hit that like button. Leave your comments and questions below and we will get right back with you. Thank you for watching this video. Remember to watch the next one. You're going to love that one.